Now, the head, discussion now, the head, what does it say and mean? In Luke 22, how does Jesus describe the one who is greater, who is greatest among, among the disciples? How does Jesus describe the one who is greatest among the disciples? Yes. He said, um, as a leader, you should be ready to serve. You should be ready to serve, yes. I thought you wanted to talk to Yes, the one who serves and you know, who the youngest. He said, if you want to be the head, you must what? Be present yourself to be the lowest. Yes. Uh, in addition to what you said, number one, if you want to be a leader, you must serve. And secondly, there are many things that come while serving. You will see many things, but just try to try to hold yourself and suppress those things so that that thing will not make you to sure. overbehave yes. in a different a negative way President. thank you like i said i think it was yesterday that i said as a leader sometimes don't just sit and tell people do like this sometimes well let's go let's go you pick when you start the team you everybody moves along with you you are not just saying it but you are doing what you are asking them to do in Romans chapter 12 what kind of attitude are we to have towards one another in the body of Christ. What is your reason? Read Romans 12, 2 for me. Read verse 2, verse 3. Romans 12. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let, let, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This for this for at 48. Yeah. Read, read three. Okay. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have have many parts and each part has a special function so it is with God's with Christ's body we are many parts of one body we and we all belong to each other in this grace God has given us all different gifts for doing certain things well so if God has given you the ability to prophesy speak out with as much faith as God has given you if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have, if you have a gift of, of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in, in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't cause them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you see you are honorable. Do all that you can you can to live in peace with everyone. Praise the Lord. So, what kind of attitude are we to have towards one another in the body of Christ? What is your reason? 
From our church, yes. Uh, praise God. Hallelujah. Now, speaking from uh, the passage we just read, like you read from verse um, 3, it says, you, hey. you should not think yourself more highly than others. Now, I will take humility. I will pick out humility from there. And um, my reasons is because uh, I'll also take a reference from Philippians chapter 2. Now, it says that we should have the same mind, mind just as Jesus, who had the very nature of God, but instead lowered himself to be a servant. And because of that, God has uplifted him and gave him a name which is above every other name. So, uh, in respect to that, we we'll see that the scripture is fulfilled, that God uplifts the humble and resists the proud. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. I want to say we should not repay evil with evil. Can we hear you from here? We should not pay someone back evil to evil. Praise the Lord. Like in verse 17, he said, Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So the question is this, what is that thing that is right? Be careful. So many of us don't really know what to do, more especially when we see ourselves in the service. Uh, maybe if someone is a kind of a coming up with a counter opposition or a counter point, you just a kind of having noticed that you are better than the person, you just a kind of begin to react. You don't have just let us see that as long as we're serving, we should try to do right the right things before the eyes of everyone and also hate evil. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the Lord. And what I want to say is that you should avoid discrimination. You should avoid discrimination. I said avoid discrimination. Like putting down your Just egos. Turn like this a little so that no. Halfway uh -huh, so that then putting down your egos, relating with everybody equally. Hallelujah. Amen. One more person. Yes. yes. Okay, okay. I think no, I'll still come back in to you. context of our passage today, I think. It just summarizes that we should we should not pay evil with evil. We should be good to others and as well. Finally, David has spoken in our class today. Finally. Yes, give this man. He has his sign is up. Uh, there's a saying, I don't know, I don't know completely, but they say to whom more power is given, more responsibility is expected. Uh, so as Christians here, as body, when that responsibility comes, we should find a way to see that it's what we are meant to do. And not, let's like say, I don't know. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the class. So let's see Everybody that as, uh, something like we are meant to do it as Christians to raise others. We should not just be selfish. Okay. No, at least let's, so that let's beat up our time. I think we, there's next question. One of the things we saw, it was calling out some gifts, right? Yes. Your gifts should be used. You should use your gift. But I've been saying it for the past three, the last two meetings, this gift of everything is coming up. Your gift is to edify others, it should help others, and should raise others also. Not just for your own glory. Do you know I can speak in tongues for 10 hours? Your tongues, who does it help? As long as it has not lifted somebody up, it's of, it's of no use. Hallelujah. Amen. According to this passage, what does service towards one another look like practically? What does service towards one another look like practically? How does that condemn or agree with our present day's idea of leadership at all levels? Yes. Are we together? Nobody's talking. We have a two-form question. There. Dr. Emma, you're welcome. This one, are you in this class today? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, praise God. I'll say that for the first part of the question, what does service towards one another look like practically? Now, from where we were, I see a service that is inspired by the love of God. Because at some point it was like, let everything be done with cheerfulness. Now, if you relate it to the second part, how does that condemn or agree with our present day ideal of leadership? You see that some persons, because of maybe they are higher in one area of gifting, they'll try to lord it over maybe the person that is a sanctuary cleaner. And for instance, over the person that maybe is gifted in prophecy and word of knowledge and is not proper. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Yes. Can I? Okay. Uh, we Christians, shall we are looking for the enjoyment part of the things. So we want to eat the rice, but not pack the plates. That's what happens nowadays. So like what we do see here, people just eat their rice, just throw the plates anyhow. <coughs> then there are servants for them to clean it. So I'm just saying, as Christians, we should learn if you eat, you walk. You don't just eat alone. Yeah, that's what's in the passage. Yes, one more person. All right. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, this is our own. Okay, so look, are you in Christian volume? Uh, service nowadays to one another, practically, it seems as being servants, that is, serving others, uh, worshiping others. And though it is not really, but when we look at our contemporary leadership now, it's not like that. We cannot, leaders of nowadays are rulers, ruling. They are not leading. You must lead, you must follow, you must do things. As our daddy said, that if you are telling people, do this, do this, you must do it first yeah. before they will follow you. But leadership of nowadays, they are commanding, do this, and they themselves will not do it. So practically, serving others is like being a servant to them. And in our own time now, we cannot, it's rare. Even though some are doing it, but generally, it is very rare. We are into command. We are into rulership and not leadership. Thank you. Yes. Just pick one and pass it. Praise God. Like in this passage of Bible, how the service was done there, yeah, I didn't see any height there. Like, that I know this person and I don't know this person. Let me favor this person I know. Let me leave this person I don't know. Like in the Bible, I didn't see it. But in our midst today, is very rampant in every organization. So as a Christian, we have to emulate this one done in the Bible. Not, I know this person and I don't know this person. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, we, we look at it. Practically, I was wondering if you hear somebody giving me a practical experience. I met, I had this situation. Okay. Praise the Lord. When it comes to service, I think we are, we are taking it the way we are just speaking to me. I want to put it in this way. For instance, if you are called, let me use this area of um, if you are called to be, to serve, for instance, they give you something to share. Now, to me, I don't know, I always see myself in that situation that everywhere I find myself in the group. They always bring Sherry something towards my side. So before you do something like that, number one, you check people that you want to share to and check things that they have given to you. If it will be enough, it will not be enough. Number one, so that you know how to handle that situation. If it is not something that is going to be enough, you know how to handle it. I'm talking in the area of sharing something. Now, there are other areas. For instance, if you are a leader in a music, Tango were acquired, and you are opportune to be on the head. Try to carry everybody along. Don't just select few people and continue to work with those ones. I always say it in my church. There are a group that if this person is not around, nothing will happen in that area because they carry on with sets of persons. And when those persons are not around, nothing will move. So when you are opportune to be at the head, try to carry everybody along, teach them. I know somebody that is running away from her choir that she don't know how to sing, but constant teaching, she can sing now. So carry everybody along. And in the second part of it that says that... How does it condemn or agree how does it to our present days? In the present days. <laughs> in these present days, as we are seeing things now, you see that some persons, they will, they will just go one side. For instance, now, just as our sister said before, segregation, that is what is happening. Segregation, the first one I spoke is how to handle things. But in the area of this segregation now that you will just come one side and you will just do it without letting these ones know about it. 
But the other one, you are doing it while everybody's seeing it. But this one, you just do it without the other part knowing about what you are doing. Thank so you. Uh, yeah? Okay. Uh, I've been trying to ask Sasha. Mm. Nowadays, I find out that we are so called gender based service. Like, people serve according to their gender. Okay. Something like that. You know that there's a, a like cooking now, they'll say this one for women. Sharing of food, women. Carrying chairs, men. So I want to understand <coughs> is that thing right or okay. wrong? For, for me, for one, let me not give the floor open. Let me just answer direct. For me, for one, there is no work that is for anybody. If you are in school, who is cooking for you as a man? So how does cooking beca become a woman team? Who sweep your room? Eh? I told people, I said, me, if you are a woman and you are not the firstborn in your house, you cannot cook better than me. And if you are the firstborn in your house and you are below 20, you are not above 20, it means you have been cooking over time. If you are not above 20, you cannot cook better than myself. General food, apart from native food. I am a mommy's boy. So I, I learned kitchen very well. So I don't think that thing is, there is anything like, there are things that it may be difficult for ladies. Like when you say carrying of chair. There are some, when you want to carry plastic chair, just can still pick plastic chair. But when the thing becomes too heavy, sometimes you say, no, you be woman, come out. Not because it, the work should not be done by a woman, but we are being sensitive because of her strength. But I don't think there's anything like that. Hallelujah. So we must, one, one of the, that is the things we must learn and come to deal with. Service should be practical. How many of us ate our biscuits and threw the leather on the ground? All my biscuits, if I finish eating, as long as there is no dust in around me, I put it in my pocket. If I leave sweet, once there is no, I think David knows. In St. Francis, if you throw this leather around, you are in trouble. So we became used to some of those services. Once I eat this, and I just squeeze it and put it in my pocket. It helps. It's another way. You may not be able to pick the one that is on the ground, but you don't drop another one on the ground. The heart. What, my, what is my attitude? Like I always said, it's an I question. So as you answer it, make it personal. What, challenge, what challenges do you face in serving others who are difficult from, who are different from you and not part of your group? Okay, favor. And uh, I start rather. Okay, sir. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Because I'm used to my groups, like other groups. So when I find myself in another group, eh, I will start monitoring the person. Like, I'll be picking faults, different faults. Like, if you do this much, I'll be like, hmm, you don't even think like this other person. That is just... Is it like that person from my place? From my place. Yes. better. Uh -huh. Give this one. You, you face insults. Like myself, yesterday, something happened yesterday night. As we were trying to share food, then some people came and they were like, ah, this one, this one. They were looking at me as if I'm a stranger. And at the same time, looking at this sister as a stranger. But our my own friends, why, why, when they came, they were like, give me, give me. After giving, giving, the one, I saw people trying to even beat us. <laughs> but at the end of everything, I, I calmed down. I was quiet. But to the glory of God, we finished uh, a kind of uh, sharing the food. That's Thank you, sir. Let me. <laughs> yes, sir. To be very practical, as usual, I talk about myself and I will talk about Joshua generation. I am in group 13. Okay? We carry this placard and we are always protesting. It's 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> I said I like to be very practical. Just clap. Up. And this is a practical question. And I'm saying that I want to use Joshua Generation as an example. My group is group 13, team 13, that's what we call it. And our services is not a very friendly one because we are carrying placards and we are protesting every time. It's 20 minutes, it's 10 minutes, 
random. You know, not everybody is happy with such a service. And if you are the one holding the microphone, you'll be very uncomfortable sometimes. But if we don't do that service, can this program run smoothly? No. Somebody can come here and say that he's uh, under spirit under or spirit. over spirit or inside spirit. Or the spirit has taken over. <laughs> and then it will take the whole day. And then everything will be messed up. And you have traveled all the way, some by flight, some by sea, some by um, even rainwater, and arrived here. And then you are not able to get what you want. I know that there are some people that they are here to dance and sing, isn't it? And if the dancing time and singing time does not come, like you see most times, when it's singing time, everybody is excited. There are people that are here to study the Bible. They came here to study. In fact, it is what they study here that they will be teaching in the next one year before they come again. And because they have been teaching every day, but this is their own opportunity to come sit and hear Reverend teach them. So I want to say that the best way I approach people in other group is by interacting. There's something called the interactive communication. Go beyond your group. Don't segregate. God hates divisive spirit, party spirit. This one is of Apollos, this one is of Paul, you know. You must take yourself away from that. There's something I used to tell my father a long time, I was a very little child. I would tell him, Daddy, you're quarreling with that man. Remember, I will not quarrel with him because I'm not part of your quarrel. <laughs> you know, and I grew up with it. <laughs> when I got to school, you know, people would go and quarrel. And when the quarrel finished, they would hold my hand and say, please, oh, don't greet him. He's, he's not my friend. I say, he's not your friend, but he's still my, my friend. friend. <laughs> You are my friend, he's my friend, but you are quarreling. I'm not part of your quarrel because I was not there. So if you keep growing like that, you will discover that life is so good and you can have a lot of friends from the north, from the south, from the west. Reduce nepotism, reduce tribalism, reduce anything that tries to bring a wall of perdition between you and the next person. Sometimes I make friends with people and it's maybe after like 20 years, I begin to find out where they come from. Because I don't really bother to know where you come from. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, okay, mommy, please, sharp one. All right. Sorry for taking your time. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, I like to treat people the same. I mean, treat everybody as the same. No partiality. But... Even at that, you still see people that will group and regroup and may not like what you're doing, even though what you're doing is right. I'm a leader of a choir group. I try to move along with everybody. I try to take everybody's suggestion. But even after all trying, you still see people that will not want to flow. And they want it another way. It's not as if I'm not doing. You're not it doing right. well. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. In, please, let's rush. Please, sorry. You know, somebody like me, I need just five minutes to get along. I, five minutes to get along. If I enter a place, no matter how strange the place is, within fifteen minutes, I say I don't want to flow, but within fifteen minutes, you would think. I've known the people for years. We must come to that point where we become open to accept. Sometimes the people you are doing, they will start looking at you. Who is this person self? Who is this person? And they may try to oppose you. But the problem with somebody like me, you cannot fight me. The more you are being more serious, the more I'm joking with you. So as you are angry, me, I'm joking with your anger. <laughs> so before you know, you, you, this thing will frustrate you, and you don't have choice and to become my friend anyway. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Who will help us with number four? Just, can you turn a little uh -huh, so that those people here will get hear you? How are we to relate to one another? Jesus spent much of his... Okay, I thought that came out of jail. Number four, how are we to relate to one another? Jesus spent much of his time with his small group of disciples. At times, the disciples argued together about who was to the greatest among them, competing for future 
positions in his coming kingdom. Jesus corrected their attitude, describing how rulers lord is over others by using their wealth or power. But not so with you. He said, I am among you as the one who serves greatness in Christ's kingdom is achieved by becoming the least. A leader is one who serves. We grow as disciples in the community of believers when we have an attitude of serving, of serve and submission to one another. Be part of it. No. Uh, okay, read, just read the B completely, then we'll discuss. That is part A. Yes, the A. Serve one another. Because Christ sacrificed himself for us, we are moved to sacrifice ourselves for him and for his people. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul urged believers not to think of themselves more highly than they ought to, ought, but to have sound judgment. And verse 5, he says, We, we, though, may, we though, though many are one body in Christ, an individually member one of another service to, towards one another flows from attitude of sacrifice humility and oneness like matthew in the introduction story we all struggle to serve one others especially if they are not part of our group or when we are thinking mostly about our own needs but when we begin to see ourselves as part of christ's body and consider the need of others as more important than our own then we can serve in true humility praise the lord praise the lord he says greatness in christ's kingdom is achieved by by becoming the least we must all come to the place of service. We must all, for you, get to the top. I think I was talking to some of my boys yesterday. I said, in life, we all need a shoulder to get to the top. But be careful, the person you are standing on your shoulder, not to match his head. When you match his head and he dodge and leave you, you will fall down woefully. We all need a shoulder to lay but as you are on, standing on that shoulder, be careful with his head. So we must all learn to serve. Jesus left all his glory in heaven. Come to the earth to do what? Come as a servant. Hallelujah. The Lord will help us to continue and to be faithful. Because, because Christ sacrificed himself for us, we, we are moved to sacrifice ourselves for him and for his people. All of us, one thing that is needed in leadership is service. And service has to do with sacrifice. Somebody said the right time, you feel like you don't want to do this thing. But because of the responsibility on you, you are moved to do. Somebody help us with B. With, okay, uh, that's A1. Okay, you take the two. Don't worry, let him take, then you take the two. described service which is characterized by love that is genuine he encourages us to have brotherly affection be eager to show honor be fervent in spirit hopeful and patient in hard times to help other believers in need and to be hospitable when we demonstrate this attitude towards other believers we are serving them as Christ and Christ in true love now, just, just let me, in, in service, as whatever you are doing, you know, some years ago, I had a serious challenge that if somebody, this man, uh, Chima, yes, Chima comes to me that he needs 500 Naira, and I know that Chima is not working, I will not give you, I will say, I don't get money. But if somebody that is working, I know that this person is working, or you have something to do, comes to me, need money, then I will give him. You know my mindset? So that tomorrow, if I'm in need, I go, since this one is not working, if I go, you don't get money to give me. But that one, then until God rebuked me, said, no, that the, the principle doesn't work that way. Because you are giving with a motive. You, are, you, have, you have lost it. When God rebuked me, and I knew that I've lost it somewhere, and I have to retrace my step, as long as you, when you come, there is, we are good to go, no matter who you are, 
no matter where you are coming from. We, we must make sure it's genuine. It's coming from a heart, a clean and an open heart. The Lord will help us. Yes. <laughs> then, number two, serve with impartiality. Verse 14 to if you finish, if you finish, then you tell you you talk a little about it. When you finish reading. In verse 14 to 18, Paul challenges the Roman believers to live in harmony together and to avoid division. He urges them not to be proud, but instead to associate with the lowly. The next paragraph. We must serve others, sharing in their joy and challenges, regardless of their race, social status and background. Verse 3. Serve with your spiritual gifts. God has given spiritual gifts to each believer to serve and build up the body of Christ. However, we tend to compare our gifts with others, seeking to build up ourselves rather than others. Paul exhorts us instead, of faith, instead to faithfully use our gifts with zeal mercy and cheerfulness in order to serve others first peter 4 10 then first corinthians 12 verse 7. okay okay what i want to say from this place i've just read is that paul um he was telling the people of romans in the epistle he wrote to them that they should be using their spiritual gifts to serve others for example now if i know how to sing or how to pray I should not be like praying for myself alone. When I'm praying, I should be praying for others. And in my service, I should be serving with humility, not to my own selfishness or only for my own adva uh, ad advantages. But when I'm serving, I should serve, having the purpose that if I help these people now, God will be glorified. Hallelujah. Give up. Submitting to one another. We are to serve the body of Christ with an attitude of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. To submit means to be under, to be under or to yield to someone else. We submit to one another when we yield to the best interest of another or the group or the interest of the group. We also submit when we put ourselves under the various authorities God has placed in our lives. Just continue. Submission does not mean that one is weak or less valuable than those who they serve. Jesus did not grasp equality with God, but instead submits his will to the will of the Father, even though he himself was God. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6, Luke chapter 2, 22 verse 42. Submission also does not mean unconditional obedience when human authority is acting against the clear with the clear will of God. Submission also does not mean speaking up. Each of us has a God-given voice with which to with which to responsibly share our ideas and concerns with those in authority. Submission means that we yield out of reverence for Christ to the leadership of those who God has placed over us, including yes. so just so what do you in this small talk, just in one or two sentences. From my understanding here, submission means yielding to the person that is above you, being totally submissive. Anytime you are giving command, just obey it without complaint. There's something, there's a slogan in, in Brigade that says, obey the last command. Even if you want to complain, obey first. After the obedience, then you can give your complaint. So submission just means being submissive, not being arrogant. Sometimes, if you become arrogant, God might place the person, God must have placed the person to help you. But because you're arrogant, it just means that you don't need help, you don't need anyone to be under. And then you just lose everything completely, even the help. Thank you. You know me, I used to have that issue with that, obey before complaint. No, me, I, I do both begin very well. You say obey before complain. After you are dealt with me for offense, I did not commit. Then you call me. So, what do you have to say? I say, no worry, no need. Praise the Lord. Now, to submit is to put your will under control. Somebody is telling you things, and you, you have everything to defend what you are saying or to defend yourself. Yet, you feel you are seeing that this thing is not like that. And now you are putting your will 
under control. You are letting your will, your right go. This thing belongs to me. I'm supposed to enjoy this one. But I said, no, give it to this person. Now, if you stand your ground, it is rightly yours. But because you want to submit, you allow it go. Are we together? Submission doesn't mean you are weak, as we, 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 we saw. It doesn't mean that you are weak. It doesn't mean that there is nothing you can do about it. There is something you can do, or you could do, or you will do, but you choose not to, to allow it be. That's submission. Praise the Lord. Now, this submission includes... No, somebody else. Yes. Church leaders, Hebrews 13, verse 7. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as they as those who will have to give an account. First Peter 5, verse 5. The New Testament clearly, the New Testament clearly establishes the role of leaders in the local church and calls each person to submit to them as leaders are accountable to them. Leaders are what? God placed us under leaders and we must submit to those leaders. Sometimes they may take a decisions that are against our will and yet we put our will under control. If you are from a church like my own, you know, one of the problems I have growing up as a young man, the only organization I belonged to in the church was Boys Brigade. And you know one funny thing about Boys Brigade? Once there is any dirty work, there is any hard work, so where BB? So and that thing became, but choir every Sunday, choir will be singing, they will give them mineral to drink. Every month, choir have allowance. But we will stand under the sun controlling traffic. Nobody tell you anything, only when there is hard work. And it became a burden for some of us. But now church, now our pastor see, uh, we grow up to today, some of us come become pastor. We they tell people to do the same thing. We are fighting that they were doing to us. And some people just have to patiently. So now when you get there, we understand that it was not really that they don't like us. That was why it was like that. But sometimes, even though you want to defend yourself, you want to stand your ground, he says, no, you allow it go. Because what? You want to be submissive. Now, towards one another. Let me know. Let's not go through. So let's beat up our timing. You must submit towards one another. Sometimes your brother, your friend, you allow your will go for that brother. You, are sit, you sat in a place, you just stood up to somebody come, sat down there. When you keep this my seat, some of us want to know, you must stand up. You can just feel, what is it, give my things. Then you move to another place. Probably you may be more comfortable in this place and you still choose to let it go. You are not, it's not because you are weak. Sometimes the strongest is the one that walk away most times. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Putting practice putting others above you. Consider how Christ value each person in this group. Think about their needs and how you could practically put their needs above your own. In this our group, can we, as, as like I told us, we'll be this family for the next one year. We'll, be, we'll have fellowship like this for the next one year. Now, how can you be able to help a brother or a sister as we join in through this one year. Think about that. You can have a personal contact with somebody. Chat, when there is need, how can you come to that, pe that person's aid? Follow the examples of Jesus, putting the need of others, even sometimes above your own. Practice effective communication with one another. That thing is lacking in the church. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Sometimes, you know, call me. Ah, now me be mumu, but they call him every day. Sometimes the person you think is not calling you may be passing through a lot. But you choose not to speak. And you feel the person neglected you. You know, sir? Like I said, I, I, I come around a nursing school where we have people that we raise. During school, daddy, 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 daddy. Somebody go, if they, if they read, say, you know, they enter, they go call you for, for night for prayer. Two o'clock. I'm going for example, I'm reading, it's not entering. Anatomy is not entering. Once the person finishes school, as you go, 
you forget about your existence. Some of them, once in a while, will still call to check on them. Some will even forget until you are checking somebody's number. You say, ah, I still get this person's number. Times, things like that. Sometimes, effective communication. And I will beg us, as this family, we must try to get at least five persons contact. Like this. Get at least five persons, at least five persons contact. Let's have an effective communication among others. Sometimes I will ask us in the group, who have you communicated to? Who have you checked on? And we'll, we'll be giving report of ourselves as God will help us as we join in. Practice giving and receiving from one another. Practice giving and receiving. I've said it before. Let me not say it again. Hope you know what I want to say. Okay. Hope you know what I want to say. So, as our, let our bond again be seen. Let our pocket also be born again. Question for discussion. How can I obey? So, this, this place, I will not be talking again. We will do the talking. What serving opportunities are in your church and community? What serving opportunity are in your church and community? How can you use your spiritual gift to help with the needs? Yes, sir. Please, let's try to... As you're asking him, please, in brief and in sum just summarize. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I would like to say that uh, for me, I would say gifts. Because when we say spiritual gifts, sometimes we seclude ourselves to the loud ones. There is something called the gift of help. And if I want to categorize it, he talked about a brigade. Is brigade a spiritual gift? But without brigade, I'm sure that, you know, we cannot even sit here comfortably. The entire security of this place is what is making you and I to sit. Administration is a gift. Those who keep our accounts and money, if they are not keeping it well, do they need to speak in tongues to count money? No. So, spiritual gifts, your talent, your skills, any capacity that God has given to you, is for the church and like i said yesterday you must serve god using it you must serve god and serve the people we call it in anglican as anglican people we say serving god and what humanity so when we are serving god and humanity we should do it for free the problem the church is having today and why we are finding it difficult to even build our cathedrals is that we are not ready to serve for free Architects cannot draw to, for church for free. Accountants cannot count money for church for free. Lawyers cannot serve, you know, they can't represent the church in court for free. But they can do it for their friend. They can't do it for church. And when you ask them, they say, church, have money. <laughs> Bring the money, let us eat it. And we are saying it, it was not so. If it were so, communities will not donate land to church and also gather and build the church. The church. And in one year, they have finished building, but now we are using 10 years to build one cathedral. Because we are waiting for the day we have one million to pay the architect that is waiting for his check. Without check, he will not put a pencil on paper. If you go to other churches, you go to some even organizations, you see people using their profession to serve God for free. And this is one thing we need in the Anglican communion. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to speak, say, what service opportunity are in your church and community? Like in my church, we have many. But in the area I want to speak is in the area of counseling and encouragement. In my church, I came to understand that there is this, uh, this lady, I, I don't used to see her in the church anymore. And when I went through her story, it happened that a brother and the same fellowship proposed a sister and still proposed her and two of them are friends and when the whole thing the summary of everything is that they came to know each other and the sister told me that there is no way she will be in that fellowship and see that sister and the same brother and she can worship god that she wants to change church she actually wants to go and worship in another different church but if if you have the gift of counseling there is how to follow people as god may have it as god may have it we spoke to her she decided that she would not go back again, but she continued. And 
as you can see it now at the end of everything just for you to understand that if you did not hear the story of this person don't judge then we had a meeting and called the two sisters together and the same sister spoke her own side and we come to understand that it's the brother that caused the problem between two of them two of them are not married yet but it caused that conflict between the two sisters and we're able to reconcile them so it's one of the service if you know that you have the gift in you do you not right just now. wait. Another one is correct people in love. Help if you have that is. gift, Help. make sure that you correct them in love. Don't correct them in the public. Call them outside mm. if you see anything in them and tell them this is what I've seen. Correct that person in love. He's part of the service. Thank you. Please, please. Our, we're already running short. So let's just let's go to the next question. We must all, every one of us, there is, there is an opportunity where you can serve. Somebody need prayer, somebody need encouragement. Please find that area and give in what you can give in that area. How might you be serving others out of obligation rather than willingness? What will you do to adjust your attitude? Yes. Let me just get just one or two. Please, brief one. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Many of us, like we say that. Maybe why I'm doing what I'm doing is because it has been obligated to me to do it. I've been mandated to do this. It's not that I willingly want to do it, but maybe if I don't do it, this person will punish me or something will happen. So, uh, how we can use our spiritual gear or how... Uh, I, it's how a personal I, yes. Uh, how I can help others is when I, when I want to do something, what motive do I have in me? For example, when I want to sing, am I coming out to stand on the stage to influence people or am I coming out so that when I'll be singing, people will be impacted? What motive do I have? Am I doing it because I, I was being forced to do it? Or do I know that when I'm doing this thing, I'm doing the right thing that God wants me to do? So let's not just do this work because we have been mandated to let us do it. It's because it is very, very right for us to do it. It is our work. Hallelujah. Thank you. Okay. Last, just one more, last person. Another one, you should be working out of love, like the love you have for what you are doing. Not that, you know, somebody compared you to do it. In my church, we used to have two services, um, youth service and other service. And because all is instrumentalists, all of us, all of us are youth. So immediately after, after the early, early morning one service, service, we just go. So Reverend decided to be doing tea for us. And most of them used to say, most of them would still eat, take the tea and still go. And when you stop doing it, then most of us vanished. So we should be doing something out of love and not because of what you can get out of it. Thank you. The truth is that you may be obligated, okay, go and do this thing. They ask you to do it. But you are not doing it because if you don't do it, the person will punish you. But as because they said do, then you are doing it from your heart. What, where, where the thing becomes, it is no longer willing. Where it is not willing is because you are not doing it because you drive joy in what you are doing, what you like, what you, what you choose to. But you are, you are looking, afraid of the consequences. If I don't do this thing, this thing will happen. Once you think of a consequence before doing anything, then it is not out of willingness again. Now let's take the... How... Okay, how are you struggling to submit to authority God has placed in your life? How can you respectfully voice your concern while yielding to them out of respect for Christ? Yes, sir. Please, brief one. Sharp. The simple answer to this is choice of words. It's unfortunate that... Um, we don't, we don't spend time to teach communication in church. And that's what we need most. The way I communicate to you and the way you communicate to me is the basis on which the church will grow or will fall. People leave church because of what somebody told them. Somebody said. And we say communication is not only just the, the verbatim, but also the actions. Your body language was me. I come to greet you the first time, the second time, third time, and you are not giving me attention. I wouldn't bother to do that the next time. So 
we should be careful with the choice of words. Some words are, are better not used because they kill. You make a statement to somebody and you say you will, you will amount to nothing in life. That person dies automatically. It takes only what we call champions who climb on words. You know, you, you tell them that they will not amount to nothing, the next day they appear as something before you. <laughs> yeah, and I want people to take that position. Don't leave the church. People give, use words to want to push you out. Don't leave. Climb on their words and grow, grow better. Challenge the status quo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, last sharp one. Um, First the camera. Go to memory How can you strengthen your com commitment and communication within your group? To me, but I will. I was fighting it by, you know, I'm this person that I get angry quickly. So whenever that, that thing comes, I try to keep quiet and I try not to speak at that moment because I know that whatever I say at that moment, I may not like it. So the only thing I do is to keep quiet because I know that I have this temperament in me to overreact. You have to have some minutes, I'll just start regretting everything that I say. I'll just thank keep you, quiet thank you, thank and hold myself. Uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All of us go to that point where the, your in church tells you what. I work with, with your guy that it was frustrating. If I sometimes I pray, may God either change me or change him so that we'll flow. But we must all come to that point and learn to put your will under subjection and learn how you say things. Sometimes what you are saying is right. But how you say it becomes wrong. My relationship. How can you strengthen your commitment or communication within your small group? Yes. Just the two of you. In one sentence. One can strengthen communication through checking out on those members of your group. Maybe you do not see the person in fellowship or you heard that the person is sick. You can just check out on the person Probably go and see the person. You will pray for the person. Thank you. His strength is good. Then, this one has to do with time and money. You give out your time. Just try to make out time for those that you are kind of working with. At the same time, you try to know their, their financial problems. So that you know where to come in and how to come in. Presently. If you meet somebody like me, you want to know financial problem, you enter trouble. Hallelujah. On a lighter note anyway. Bluff. We must all strengthen, like I always said, when we get to this point, but no matter what you have done before, you can do better. Sorry, we're already running out of time. Sorry, sir. We are, no matter what you have done before, we can do better. Hallelujah. Our time is already fast spent. We need to pray. Then we'll take our memory verse and then we'll pray. Yeah? But I can't, sorry, sir. We are, our time has already spent. Now let us memory verse Romans twelve ten. Everybody, open your. <coughs> are we there? One to go, love one another with brotherly affection. I'll do one another in showing honor. Let us pray. Can you just bow down your head and talk to the Lord? Can you reflect and pray about what we have learned this morning? This lesson. Can you reflect about it? Where are you lacking? Where do you need help? What do you need to strengthen? Where are you struggling in, be, in, in being submissive? Just reflect. Check your life. Check yourself. Check your joining. In the leadership position, how are you struggling? As a subordinate, how are you struggling? Can you ask the Lord to help you now? Ask the Lord to help you. Those places you discover those weaknesses, can you ask the Lord to help you? Ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord for grace. Can you pray for those people around you, those your friends, your colleagues? That you know you're struggling with, maybe another leader in another group that is, that is struggling with the same kind of thing you are struggling. Can you remember them in your prayers this morning? Some of the members that you know are struggling with what you are struggling, can you ask the Lord to help them? Can you pray for others also? In Jesus' name, we pray.
Thank you, Father, for the study this morning. Lord, we ask us, we have struggled, we have learned, Lord, to be submissive. In every our area of struggle, Lord, you become our strength. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen.